Hello, good morning. Can everyone hear me? I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Amy Elliott. This is my real contact information. Feel free to photograph me, tweet at me, or email me um, if you'd like to keep the conversation going. Um, unlike many uh, people who choose to work in privacy, um, I'm actually fairly open. Um, so f despite my pixelated photo, feel free to go ahead and uh, take a picture, start the conversation. I am based in Berlin, but I work for an American nonprofit called Simply Secure. You all in this audience are exactly the audience of the type of practitioner we are working to empower to protect people's privacy. We work with developers, researchers, and users. I myself am a user experience researcher. Uh, I spent 20 years working um, in and around Silicon Valley and San Francisco. I was a research scientist at Xerox PARC, working on um, IoT applications back when it was still called ubiquitous computing. But I come to you um, from more of a business background. I spent eight years at IDEO San Francisco, working with companies like Acer, like Samsung, um, global companies um, on tech strategy. And through that, I felt uh, kind of personally called to uh, make a career shift to join a nonprofit and work on issues of privacy. Last year, that brought me from San Francisco to Berlin. I think um, Berlin is a, a special time and place for this conversation, and I'm really glad to share um, what we're working on um, with the audience here at DroidCon. So the number one point I would like to uh, convey to you all today is you do not need to be a cryptographer to work in security. So nothing wrong with cryptography. Some of my best friends are cryptographers. TLS certificates, anyone? Just, so um, I think that there is a, a perception that security is, is very kind of this matrixy green and, and black and, and very technical. And um, maybe that's exciting and compelling to you, or maybe you find it off-putting, because much of the, the language around it is cyber threat attack, and it's very militaristic, and it, it doesn't necessarily speak to some of the um, human values of protecting and caring for others. So in order to really get to a point where we're truly providing security for a global audience, doing things like banking, communicating with their loved ones, all of the things that we're depending on apps to help us do, we need a multidisciplinary community of developers, but developers with sensitivities and, and designers and researchers and, and more kinds of people. And uh, I'm here today to explain some of these contributions um, to the world of security and how it can protect people's privacy. So I mentioned the cyber threat language um, already, but I think that one of the shifts that, that the security community is working to make is from the language of no, no, you shall not open this attachment, and very negative, scolding, defensive language, to uh, a change to the side of yes. And yes, we are people that are building products that are reliable, that are trustworthy, that behave with data in a responsible way. And those are positive things that can draw people to our services and our products and our software. So, um, I believe, as a, a new Berliner, that German culture is positioned for leadership and security. And if just seeing the words German culture together on a slide with such a magazine is making your uh, blood pressure maybe get a little high, then good morning, congratulations, um, you're, you're paying attention. Um, the, the point that I want to make is this is a magazine I found in my hair salon. And I, um, as a, a new Berliner and a German learner, it's, it's about the level that I can sort of understand. And um, this, is, this is an article in, in this magazine. It's about location tracking. And it is fascinating for me as someone coming from the Silicon Valley context that this is considered just general purpose information that someone needs to know 
um, along with you know what's going on with the British royal family, um, and you know this is how location tracking works and what you should do to take care of yourself. It's it's remarkable, and I think that this community in this room is positioned to do great things. This is making the same point. Um, this is a snapshot from um, a very small um, relay store in an airport, not a large specialist bookshop. I am blown away by the depth of discussion and the resources and the cultural support. I think you know, Android and software development occupies a, a place in the cultural conversation that you know, people are looking to you in this room and also counting on you uh, to make good and ethical choices. So there are three parts to this talk. I'll kick off by talking about understanding some of the risks um, to users. So corporations and governments gather data about us. This is a, a graphic done um, for the Tor project from uh, Kajart Studio. Um, I think that which of these two you're worried about probably depends um, on your geography. And so, um, in Germany, I have found that there is a um, great mistrust and skepticism and a hostility towards the Silicon Valley companies, um, such as the, those on the left that you can identify even though their icons are a little different. Um, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, there is great mistrust of the government and a lot of um, enthusiasm uh, for the tech companies that are specifically seen as helpful and in good and protective of the people. So as we um, acknowledge that the world is a bigger place than only Germany and the United States, I think it's important to keep in mind um, that in security terms, the threat model is really not the same for everyone. And if Germans are, are very um, trusting of their government, that's not necessarily true in the US. And I want to make this point um, extremely clear. Um, I think that there is a misconception that this is a new thing um, you know, since Trump has become the president in November, and that is incorrect. This is an example from TechCrunch um, talking about Twitter. In 2014, when Barack Obama was the president, fighting against the US government to protect uh, information from the users of Twitter. This is a very kind of long-standing conversation in the US. It, it did not just start in, in November. So um, switching over um, to the corporate side, iKettle. So I know that many people in this room are working on, on products like this. I'm, as a designer, really drawn to a lot of the elements of maker culture. There is a lot of fun, creativity, and positive energy. But from a security point of view, I would just like to use this as an example. So iKettle, they're available today on Amazon, you can get one for 116 euros, is a kettle that's controlled by an app. This is a map of London. The people in London are really into their tea. You can see a number of these eye kettles. So it turns out that the eye kettle development team made some poor security choices, and it, it is possible to pop uh, the Wi-Fi of someone who has an eye kettle. And it's possible to plot them on a map. So if you buy an eye kettle and you end up compromised in this way on this map, you're essentially on record as being kind of stupid. So someone, like a thief, will know that you have enough money to spend a hundred something euros to boil water, and you do not have a good story about your security, and here is your house. So this is, this is sort of one, one example of um, some unintended consequences um, you know, of, of these kinds of products. And you know, it's not only an individual harm, and I'm poking gentle fun at, at both you know, the team that created this product and the consumers that bought it, but there's a, a lot of exciting things that are happening in terms of how we're going to live and, and work and play and love and interact with these apps. The bigger point here is it's not only this one-to-one -one consumer product relationship. Something bigger is happening. So the Mirai botnet, um, last year took over many, many, many IoT devices, um, a lot of you know, routers, DVRs. I put some uh, baby monitors and, and cameras in the slide just um, for illustration purposes. And 
The reason that this is bad is that it is DDoSing websites. It's, it's taking websites offline. So that means that if there's any part of the open internet that you value, that could be from a commercial lens. Hey, your team is finally going to get something up on Product Hunt, and all eyes are on your startup. Well, if you're DDoSed and your website doesn't work the day that you're up at the top, you're not going to get a do-over. Like from a market perspective, that your, your, your company and your idea just isn't you know, able to compete. Similarly, in terms of a lot of the questions of censorship and journalism and, and you know, fake news and, and these kinds of things, it's easily possible to silence independent journalists by making it difficult for them to self-publish. So if there's any element of the open web that you care about and you want to preserve, it makes sense to take some care on the security concerns. Because the con security concerns are not only between one wealthy person in London and their teapot, it, there's a social uh, good and a social dependency to having the open internet work for everyone. This is an example of some field work I did in New York, um, in Harlem, speaking with members um, of the African American community around surveillance. Specifically, we were focused um, on police surveillance, but corporate surveillance um, was kind of a, a surprise for me um, at the time. We met um, at a Dunkin' Donuts coffee shop. I know they've, I've seen them also here in Berlin. And the woman that I interviewed there is a user of the DD Perks app, which you can see advertised um, over her shoulder. So DD Perks is an app that is the modern equivalent of the um, loyalty card that you, you get a stamp every time you buy a cup of coffee or, or a donut or something. And um, I was very interested to learn that the privacy settings of the Dunkin' Donuts app, this is the German edition, are extremely aggressive, in my opinion. So it's uh, tracking your location, of course, because everyone that's working in the commercial app is very interested in beacon technologies and tracking shopping behavior. It also wants the contents of your media. Of course, it also wants your storage, the Wi-Fi connection, all kinds of things, you know, keeping device from sleeping. This is, this is a, you know, a fairly substantial list of things. And from a development point of view, I think that you in this room know better than anyone that there are very good reasons to ask for a lot of permissions up front so that you can update your software later. Uh, I'm just putting this up there because most audiences that I show this to are fairly surprised. One of the ways the US Dunkin' Donuts DD Perks app works is um, there's a social component. And um, the way this might work is I could say, hey, it's your birthday, and you're in another city, but just I'm thinking of you, and, and here's a, a, a cup of coffee and a donut from me on your birthday. And I believe that the development team that worked on this probably thought, oh, that's a nice social piece. It's a reasonable functionality that someone might want in this app. But what's happening here? Now, Dunkin' Donuts has a very specific, uniquely identified database of people with their birthdays and their physical locations and the social network graph between them. And is Dunkin' Donuts, you know, despite however much the people of New York love their coffee, really the sort of organization we, we want to entrust with this kind of data? And I think that that's a, a question for all the people in, in this room. And, you know, Dunkin' Donuts is not unique here. Pretty much, um, the, in general, the, the fast food and restaurant and cafe apps that I've looked at are all pretty similar. And so one of my goals here today is for you all to have a, a moment where you consider some of the implications of these kinds of decisions in the development process and making sure that you're asking for the permissions that you need and not needlessly collecting data data um, that could become a liability at a later time. So finally, in this section, I'm going to talk about Ashley Madison. Ashley Madison is famous or infamous um, in the kind of US security and privacy conversation because it's a website or was a website to help married people have affairs. 
the US is extremely puritanical still today when it comes to sex, so the consequences of, of being known to have a, an extramarital affair are, are pretty severe. So at least one person actually committed suicide when it was learned that he was a user of this site and had had an affair. So. Um, it's, it's an extremely serious thing. And the, the point that I'd like to make with these two screenshots is not a hacking point. They were famous for being hacked despite their whole brand promise around privacy. But the, these two images show something that is, is deeper and trickier and more subtle that all of you that make something that has a login should consider. So, to make the point more extreme, I'm gonna change the wording a little bit. Basically, if you're having an affair, or you're worried if your partner is having an affair, you can check and see if they are a user of Ashley Madison without doing any hacking. The way you do this is you type in an email address and say you for forgot the password. And you get two different answers based on if the address is found in the database or not. So from a commercial point of view, a lot of people developing products are under intense pressure to got to get those conversions and make it easier to sign up for an account. So if I say, hey, is my husband at gmail.com in the database, and it says, you forgot your password, great, I'll send it to the email on file, then I know, hey, my husband is in this database. If I type my husband at Gmail and I get a different message that says, sorry, not found, would you like to sign up? Then I get that bit of information. So you could say, well, no one cares if someone is known to have an eye kettle or no one cares if someone uses my product or service, but I'm asking you all to consider, is that really your call? And are there things that you can do, not at the traditional security le level, but taking a more holistic product design point of view, engaging with the people on your team that write copy for the user interface? Because I'm sure whoever wrote this Believe that they were doing a good job. If you're already a member, like do this. Like those words on screen weren't put there by elves. Like someone, someone wrote that. So engage with more people around you on the UX side, on the writing side, on the brand strategy side to come together to protect security. So that was some of the risks. How can UX design kind of uh, lead us through into this new kind of world in which we find ourselves? So I don't read Chinese. Um, this is uh, from Dan Grover, who um, used to work in China as a UX designer. But I, I call this slide kind of a locks of the Chinese mobile internet. And I think that um, this is a provocative example to make the point that UX design, when I am speaking about user experience design, I mean something deeper than the cosmetics of these icons. Because all these icons are intended to convey something about security, but what do they mean? In the context of the Chinese mobile internet, where Chinese government has been very clear that they take a vested interest in what happens on their networks, what does a lock icon like this convey? As a designer with no coding skills, I can make a GIF that has two states. One state is open, and then you click on it, and then it's closed. And what happened? Nothing. There was no change in the code underneath. There was a lock icon that was open, and someone clicked on it, and now they see it closed. So I am not prepared to unpack the details of, of what exactly is happening on the um, you know, security side for all of these different apps, but I'm saying that um, it's not enough to be usable. These icons and th these interactions need to convey meaning in order to be truly trustworthy. So the Chrome team has done a lot of, of work on this, and uh, I think that their decisions around starting to throw errors for HTTP instead of HTTPS um, you know, web content is very interesting and is an example uh, to copy. Uh, I mean, you can, you can see from this, this table, there are so many different ways in which different browsers treat these kinds of states, like minor errors, major errors, how is mixed content handled. Um, as a consumer or an end user or someone that's not used to tracking security, we're actually making um, 
requests of the, of the users to keep track of some of these things. And people who use multiple browsers need to kind of develop a feel for how these different icon systems work. But I do think that you know, in this case, the browser is making an editorial point of view that some forms of content are dangerous in communicating risk to the users. And that's going to get more extreme as, as, in Chrome as, as they continue um, you know, down this path of, of, of trying to encourage all content to go to HTTPS. So this is a, a more pure interaction design um, example. These are iPhone screenshots. And I am personally excited and inspired by some of the ways messaging apps are communicating complex things with a very simple visual vocabulary. So on the far left, this is the iPhone view if you're messaging with someone that does not have an iPhone, probably Android. Android conversations are green bubbles in the iPhone universe. Other iPhones are blue bubbles. So you know at a glance as an iPhone user if someone is on an Android or not. What the implications are and what an average user understands from that, I'm not sure I haven't seen that research, but it, it's visually prominent. The next level down from that is the way in which red receipts are handled. So using just a few characters in the middle example, you see red. You can also see delivered as a potential state. Not a lot of characters, but it's letting you know this message has gone from my phone through some kinds of steps and is on the other person's phone. And one of the very exciting ways in which this is handled is the, the WhatsApp example uh, on this side. So WhatsApp group messages use a convention um, that check marks appear when different people in the group have read it. I know that that interaction design decision, that user experience decision has changed my behavior. How? Because if a message pops up on my phone and I don't want to deal with it, I am very careful not to touch my phone. I do not want that check next to my name because then I'm being rude by not responding quickly. So if I just don't touch it and I wait for the alert to go away, then I have a little bit more time to formulate a response without being rude. That is a UX decision. It is completely possible for a different messaging app to have the functional capability to issue red receipts. But if the way that you get to the red receipt is to long press on the sender's name and then go to the status menu and then type in you know, message ID, you know, whatever the code for the message ID, and then see status equals one, that is not going to change behavior in the same way. So this is a, these are fairly lightweight, elegant examples that help someone understand more about how these systems work. And I think that we as a community have some hard work ahead of us to help people make sense of some of these more complex IoT embedded system applications, as well as all of the ways um, that apps use data. So how can we take red receipts, which are working, and expand that out into a, a bigger, uh, more general class of problems? So um, TunnelBear um, is a, a VPN. And I've been using them for some time as an example of brand strategy um, that is the opposite of this cyber threat down um, green and black, very kind of computer code um, language. They don't actually um, use the word VPN in their materials. They are extremely cute and approachable with this metaphor um, of a bear, grizzly bears. They protect people. They uh, put the paw over the face or chew through the cable. It's all very lightweight and, and, and playful, but the way in which that's done just makes sense. Like Humans understand that bears have certain properties. They're based in Canada. That's good. It makes sense with bears. Um, no logging, public Wi-Fi. And this is, this is um, an example of a company that not only working on the technical security side, but got an illustrator that understood what they were trying to do, and hired writers that understood what they were trying to do, and put that all together into a package that conveys a certain kind of trust and robustness. So Slack. I'm personally a very heavy user of Slack. It's an enterprise communication tool. Um, the functionality in many ways is not new. People have been on IRC for 
decades, um, but some of the design decisions that they made have, have influenced behavior in some new ways where we're seeing distributed teams, such as the one that I'm on, using it in new ways. So, Slack has very positive kind of brand connotations. It's very friendly and approachable. And this example with the rooster on the top left is giving me an alert that says, I'm about to send a message to 63 people in seven time zones, am I sure? And their choice of the rooster and that dialog box makes me feel good about Slack. It does not feel like an error. It does not feel like it's interrupting my workflow. It makes me think like, Slack does not want me to make a fool of myself at work. Thank you, Slack. Now, um, as much as I like Slack and appreciate that kind of thing, they don't make every decision that I would agree with. And one which I think is particularly uh, dangerous and provocative is the way Slack bot works. Slack bots are bots that read messages. Many teams have their own um, language for what Slack bot can return as a humorous response. The example here, someone asks for the Wi-Fi password and Slack bot replies. Um, GIFs are really popular with Slack bots. If someone types Friday, then the Slack bot returns an animated GIF of balloons or something. But this message on the bottom, I think, is, is where I take issue as a, a privacy person. Custom Slack bot responses occur in channels and in conversations with Slack bot, but not in direct messages with other team members. So if I have a one-to-one -one DM channel with my colleague Scout, and I type in Friday, then Slack bot is not going to give the response. So their explanation for that is that it would be rude. But it creates an illusion for me as a user that Slackbot is not listening to that conversation. So if I type the word Friday in channel one and I get a GIF balloon, I understand that that's what's happening because Slackbot read it. If I type Friday in a one-to-one -one direct message and Slackbot does not give me GIF balloons, I falsely believe that Slackbot is not reading that message. But of course Slackbot is reading the messages. I'm typing all of this in a proprietary platform, Slack has all the messages. It's not like this is some super secret thing that you know, only, only the two of us have access to. It's a design decision that's conveying something about how the system works that isn't necessarily accurate um, from a technical point of view. And so I think that um, as much as I appreciate Slack for its ability to bring people together, um, there are some good questions to ask about how we inform or mislead people. So, um, San Francisco, I spent 20 years there. Like many cities in the US, um, it has an array of always on microphones listening for gunshots. Um, because 2017, you know, um, that's actually been there um, for a, a while, as far as I know. This is from Forbes. Forbes is a, a business magazine. It's, um, it's not known for being progressive. It's not really known for being political. It's a business magazine. Um, and they're discussing this company called uh, ShotSpotter. It's a gunpoint detection system. So um, th the point here is that this is a kind of new public infrastructure. A private company has installed microphone arrays in places all over the city, only in key areas. I don't really know. I'm not sure how one learns that information. It's listening for something. And from what I've been able to glean from this article and from um, Shot Spotter's public-facing materials, it's listening for um, audio profiles that are consistent with gunfire and then automatically calling the police. Um, as a person standing on the street, I have no way of knowing that the system exists. I have no way of knowing what information is being collected. I have no way of knowing to whom it is being sent. Um, the best case is that some sorts, types of sounds are being sent to the police, I guess. Are they getting the sounds or just an alert? Who maintains this equipment? Has ShotSpotter been acquired by a different company? I believe this stuff has been in place for quite some years now. Is it up to date? Is it security patched? I mean, these are all good questions that I think that we need to start to ask ourselves. Um, how are we going to make sense of this new kind of world around us? And Amazon Alexa, I think that um, voice interaction is interesting. I mean, it's just cool. But 
We also need to be mindful of the fact that we're installing essentially corporate surveillance equipment in our homes, and uh, it's not exactly clear how that's gonna work. So one example is um, Santa Clara County, California, the kind of the main county um, of Silicon Valley. More than half of the people speak a language other than English at home. People come from all over the world to be there. It's, it's more common than not to speak a language other than English at home. That means that Amazon Alexa knows that. I mean, it's going to know, it's going to be able to detect if this is an English conversation, is it not an English conversation? Um, there are a variety of implications for that, from access to technology, making that equitable. If, if, you, if you speak English with an accent, can this machine understand you? Are we creating barriers that exclude people? But also, um, on the political side, the U.S. government has been you know, fairly clear uh, with an anti-immigration platform. Are we counting on the Amazons and the, the people that are holding these voice data sets to, to know if people speak a language other than English at home? Are they going to do what Twitter did and try to push back on the federal government about, um, with their national security letter examples? Or are they going to say, hey, here on the map, just like the T, kettles. Here are all the people that are not speaking English at home. And so this is all hypothetical because, you know, of, of course, there's no law against speaking a language other than, than English at home. Um, but I think that um, it behooves us at this moment in time where we're seeing a lot of political changes and social changes and cultural changes together with some new technology changes to think for a moment about what some of these implications are and how as a developer community we can care for others and protect their privacy. So um, maybe this video will work, but to, to set it up a little bit, when I think about the relationship between the, the pocket computer that I have and a lot of the IoT applications, I see, for example, the idea that, oh, the way that the shot spotter should work is uh, you should get an alert on your iPhone that you're being recorded and it's being sent to the police or in the Amazon Alexa case, what's the check or the red receipt mark that's gonna say, hey, um, we're sharing this data with some other government. And the point that I wanna make is um, the notification and alert language that we have throughout the platform is not going to scale to the challenges that we have. So as an example of what this might be like, this isn't one example example of Instagram notifications. So I don't know if people um, are heavy users um, you know, of Twitter or if you've ever been in a situation you know, where you're seeing something like this. So I mean, it's not fake. If you have 8 million Instagram followers, it's just going to scroll and scroll and scroll. So I, th I think we get that. The clock will turn over at some point. It's, it's, a, long, it's a long time to, to watch that. Um, but the idea here is from the user experience side, if we want to protect people's privacy, we have hard work to do on the brand side, the strategy side. All of the pieces need to come together. And how can we expand this language of alerts so that it's just not kind of completely uh, compromised when you're walking down a heavily instrumented street and the tea kettle and the step and, and you know, everything is trying to take data from you. And we have all these apps in our pockets that are, that are sharing information about us with groups that we don't necessarily understand. So uh, the final section of this talk is a little bit of practical advice, because I wanted to close on a note of some things that you could do in your own professional practice that, that are, are just small steps in this direction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about phishing um, in the context of, of building products uh, that people trust. So, Phishing, it's trying to obtain sensitive information um, through dubious causes. So usernames, passwords, credit cards, compromising accounts. And these are some examples of easy to spoof URLs from a hypothetical company that I just made up called 
like Berlin streetwear that's uh, you know, part of like Silicon Alley here in Berlin. And the difference between the, the top and, and the, the, the second line is there's an extra L in Alle. Now, it's no secret that registering uh, slightly different domain names is a way to extract people's credentials because someone not paying attention might go to the wrong website and enter their password. And then whoever created the Silicon LLA now has your password or now has your credit card. The people that are making these decisions around how a website is structured from an information architecture point of view and a content strategy point of view aren't necessarily the security team. A lot of times these are business decisions. Going through the hypothetical example in the second, the second kind of block of things, the difference between berlinstreetwear.com easy pay and berlinstreetwear.easypay.com or easypay.com slash berlinstreetwear. There are implications to all of these choices in terms of how we're expecting an end user today to verify if a website is the right website and if it's safe to type their username and password in. And no, and then once you start getting into marketing messages at the bottom, you can start to get to some really crazy things where these, these long URLs that have nothing to do with your actual company. And these are decisions that affect everyone, not just in a one-to-one -one relationship between the person trying to buy a, a pair of you know, clothes or something from a hypothetical website, but to everyone that cares about the open web, how can we create more secure futures? Now, the reason that I use those examples with so much text is things start to get pretty nuts when you have limited screen real estate. This is not PayPal, okay? This is a fraudulent site with a much longer URL that is designed to look like it's PayPal if you don't click in um, the URL bar and see the whole thing. So this is good, right? Like, that would fool a lot of people. I freely admit I could easily be, be fooled by that, and I know better. Like, people are going fast and they're doing things. It is up to us as a community of people in this room to make this harder. And one of the things that we can do as a practical tip is to think about the structure and think about these implications and how you communicate trust to people so that there's less risk of this happening. One more example on the writing side. Um, I am a customer, an actual paying customer of Google's G Suite. So I get very chipper and brisk business productivity emails from them. But that language does not carry through all of their products. So this is the Chrome error. And the difference between on the left, this very kind of businessy marketing team kind of boost your productivity um, email compared with the, on the product, you know, this aw oh, snap is very kind of casual. It's like in a black background. It's hacker. Like, I know why that is like that. I understand legacy code. I was an early early user of Chrome. I'm, I'm not knocking their decisions. I'm just saying, beyond like Google as a, as a free for money um, service, there's a big inconsistency there. And that inconsistency makes it harder for me as a customer to know if the email on the left is legitimate or not because the tone is just so different. And we know, going back to the US and the US's political issues, we know that one of the leaders of the, the Democratic um, you know, National Committee was hacked because of access to Gmail. And many things, many failures, bad information, whatever, were in place to enable that. But I think there's also an underlying issue that it's not always clear how Gmail or G Suite or, or these Google products would talk to me. And I see this message on the right a lot more. Like, I, people live in your product. Like, the writing in the product really matters. And that's maybe deserving of some more attention. The last things, also on the visual and the style guide side. So um, I started with this example at the very beginning of the locks of the Chinese internet. And the point there was that, you know, the kinds of user experience interactions I want to focus on during this talk are not the, the, the more cosmetic color choices and logo choices. Now I'm closing that loop by saying, actually, color choices and logo choices matter a lot. This is a little excerpt from Simply Secure's style guide. We use particular colors. Why does that matter? Well, if you get to something such as the company in the top right, 
Starbucks. They own that green so completely, they don't even need to put their logo on it. Everybody knows a cup with that circle of green is a Starbucks cup. How did they get there? Worldwide, whatever they had to do to their supply chain to make sure the ink that comes from you know, this extract on this tree, they have got that green dialed. We are all super clear if something is from Starbucks or not. So as you're getting the logos on your t-shirts or your stickers and you're thinking cross-platform, reaching a global audience, have a care for this because these things have consequences, such as the stuff on the, on the left, which are again the phishing attacks, which um, are enabled when uh, companies are not consistent and it's not obvious to a consumer. Is this really, really from the company or did someone just take the logo? So, understanding risks to users, leading through design and practical advice, understanding risks. People today are giving away their personal data for the price of a cup of coffee. App permissions are aggressive. People don't understand the consequences. It's up to us as a community to make better choices and guide development in more positive and ethical directions. Leading through design, I think red receipts are interesting. That is a metaphor I would like to extend into some new frontiers, into voice, into IoT, into other kinds of products and services. And finally, practical tips. These are small, subtle things that development teams benefit from having a multidisciplinary crew that also includes researchers and UX designers and writers and brand strategists in order to get together to secure the whole product. You do not need to be a cryptographer to work in security. These issues are critical and they affect everybody. So to close, I'm going to give you a small commercial for Simply Secure. We have um, a knowledge base, which is a bunch of resources targeting audiences like yourselves. Um, these are some of the um, topics of articles you can find there. You have my Twitter information or my email. Let me know if it's working. Let me know what resources you'd like to see. Um, also, feel free to join us in Berlin the evening of November 8th. We're hosting a salon. And with that, I will say thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much. I think there might be some questions, but we have to limit the Q&A sessions to maximum five minutes because we have to split up and uh, make sure everybody reaches his or her uh, presentation in the other rooms. So, four questions, please go to the microphone, to one of the microphones. Do we have any? No, we don't. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, what solution would you pro propose for the Ashley Madison problem? Because I understand for password recovery you could just have a consistent behavior, but I also see when you register and you put your email, you need to somehow uh, tell the user that this email is in use or something is already wrong, and you can fish through this. this Yes, that is true. It is a difficult problem. I think it, the idea is to add perhaps a bit more friction. Password recovery and account creation is tough, and there is no right solution for every case, but I think it's worth paying more attention to. 